But it was only in the time of the war when all these splendid young fellows were disappearing from our view. The whole world was saying, well, what's become of them? Where are they? What are they doing now? Have they dissipated into nothing? Or are they still the grand fellows that we used to know? It is the spirit of Houdini we wish to contact. Houdini, are you here? Are you here, Houdini? Please manifest yourself in any way possible. The main idea is that we have these incredible collections here and we have researchers that come from all over the world, but we're really wanting to figure out other ways of being able to activate the collections and making them accessible to audiences who may not you know, otherwise just sign up for a research account and come in and see the objects themselves. A place called uh, Houdini Speaks to the Living and it is based on the very true fact that uh, Harry Houdini was, towards the end of his career, going on these lecture tours. So he would do a, a magic show that was divided into three parts. One part, uh, kind of small magic. One part, great spectacle. And the third part was seance busting. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is also going on lecture tours in favor of spiritualism, trying to spread the great news about spiritualism. So what the play does is it, um, with a little bit of artistic license, puts these two gentlemen together as if they happen to be in the same city on the same night and allows them both time on stage to plead their cases. The Harry Houdini collection at the Ransom Center is one of the largest collections of Houdini material in the world. The collection is expansive. It includes uh, his, uh, Harry Houdini's personal records, his photographs, correspondence, uh, contracts relating to his film work. Half of the collection is actually Houdini's uh, collection of other magicians. Uh, he was also an incredible collector of American and British theater history. He never had a formal education, and so there was this attempt, it seems like, for him to want to uh, prove to people that he knew what he was talking about, that he was cultured, that he was educated. Aside from just being a great magician and artist, he was a metaphor for people. He was an outsider, but he couldn't be contained. You know, I think people loved that story at the time. He was a smaller guy, <laughs> but he was larger than life. And I think that was a nice, again, a nice um, image for people to have at the time. He was, in some ways, America's first superhero. Houdini wanted desperately to believe in spiritualism, his, especially after his own mother died, uh, who he was very close to. Uh, he, he also went to mediums, but kept seeing people get scammed, and this bothered him immensely. Uh, so he made it a life's mission to debunk spiritualism. I think the most surprising thing that I learned about Houdini was how committed he was to saving people from being victims of false mediums. He didn't want anyone to feel deluded, especially knowing how fragile people were, specifically in this time. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, another fascinating character and such an incredible uh, walking dichotomy. A man who writes about Sherlock Holmes, uh, a, a man who thrives on logic, um, and yet Sir Arthur a complete and confirmed believer in spiritualism. One of the things that Beth shared with me and that is part of the research that she sent me is that he was particularly um, convinced or dumbfounded by tricks that were mentalist tricks, tricks wherein the, the medium is able to deduce things about the audience members very quickly and seem as if they already know them or they're speaking through the spirit world about them. And it seems clear to me, though there's some decidedly inductive reasoning in me positing this, that everything that falls out is a quest to to find hope that and perhaps find his son in the afterlife and so I think it's a it's a yearning that emerges from deep grief uh, and he perhaps is too uh, stiff upper lipped to admit that it's really about him and he makes it about others and the quest for truth but I think he just he just wants his dear boy back Anything, so on. My 
son. Bring me my son. No, your boast, sir, was that you could recreate. So often I do not claim that I can produce or materialize legitimately the loved ones of you or anyone else, but I do claim and know that I can go to any seance along with you. And whatever happens there, I can reproduce exactly. Evan Powell, a simple coal miner, brought Kingsley to us at a seance. <laughs> My wife exclaimed, it's Kingsley. And then I heard a voice, his voice. Father, I asked him if he was happy. So happy. And then I felt his touch upon my head. And he was gone. I challenge any man here to say that was a devil. If any man says so, it only shows the twists a man's mind may take. His vision was good and holy. His manifestation is your challenge. I know the seriousness <coughs> of trifling with the hallowed reverence we bestow on the departed, and I do not wish to be guilty of such frivolity. Orders on crime to make you believe. I am not talking about what I believe. I am not talking about what I think. I am talking about what I know. A good magician is like sells you a ticket to a roller coaster, and you get on the ride, and you go through all these loops and all these emotions and all these thrills, and then at the end, you get off the roller coaster and you return to reality. You know, the magic represents a fun fantasy, but the opposite of that would be a medium. Uh, a fortune teller who sells you a ticket to the ride, but when you get on top, just pushes you off. Doyle would offer evidence, physical evidence, uh, spirit photos, uh, you know, written testimonies from people who attended seances, who, uh, who claimed that the medium knew things that only their departed one would have known, uh, and, and really claiming this as fact. And, and Houdini would then try to piece it out and really pick it apart and say, you know, I can, I can show you exactly how those spirit photographs were done. Uh, you know, I can, I can show you all the medium tricks and, and how they work. Those debates play out at a time that speaks volumes, actually, about what's going on uh, in the West. Uh, during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, this anxiety of uh, technology and uh, you know the, the sort of absence of religion that happens with with the emergence of these wars and in industry. Uh, so to be able to uh, see that play out between the collections is, is fascinating. When Harry Houdini died, uh, he beforehand he had given both Bess Houdini and Arthur Conan Doyle a sort of a, a code or a password or some sort of a message that only they would know and they weren't to share with anybody so that whoever would die first and of course they didn't know uh, whoever would die first they would promise that they would try to come back and give this message to them so that they would know for, for a fact that spiritualism was real uh, and so when Houdini died uh, Bess continued to have seances on an almost yearly basis uh, for several years after. Doyle continued, uh, he actually published a book shortly after Houdini's death that claimed him as, as one of the great spiritualists of, of the turn of the century. Uh, partly, perhaps even just to, if he could come back from the dead, just to make him angry and ensure that he would try. <laughs> After faithfully following through the 10-year Houdini compact, using every type, medium, and seance, it is now my personal and positive belief that spirit communication in any form is impossible. I do not believe that ghosts or spirits exist. The Houdini shrine has burned for 10 years. I now reverently Turn out the light. It is finished. Good night, Harry. Well, <laughs> goodbye. I'm alive.